Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today is Memorial Day, and I just wanted to acknowledge it. I know it's not normally a class day. Um, and, you know, if those of you don't feel like you want to be here, I completely understand that. It's a very sacred day to recognize those of us um, who have family members or friends or just generally who have served in the military and have 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 um, have passed away or, or died um, fighting for us, fighting for our freedom. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And um, I know I have had some family members that um, um, that were veterans passed away actually in battle and and things like that so just want to acknowledge that thank you for being here um today this week um we are going to do a couple things this is of course really the the final um full week uh, today we're going to cover the second part of the reproductive system which would be the female reproductive system um, it's pretty extensive, um, so we'll get through much of it, but um, probably not all of it. I'm not going to rush through it. Um, we'll do some today. We'll finish it on Wednesday. Um, also on Wednesday, we will have a, a review for the um, exam, lecture exam. Um, the uh, study guide is posted on uh, Canvas, so you guys can take a look at it there. As I mentioned before, this is a 100 point question, uh, 100 point exam. So it's really like two exams combined. So um, it is going to be, however, um, so it's 100 points. There are going to be 50 questions. It is going to be a combination of multiple choice and true false. There will be no essay or short answer questions. Um, so that's that. Um, just as a reminder, many of you have turned in your extra credit, which is great, extra credit reports. Um, if you haven't, you have until May 28th. The easiest way is just to email it to me, email attachment, and, is, and, I, and as soon as I get it from you, I will try to at least say I got it, because I know sometimes people are concerned that an email goes into the spam folder or just sort of goes into cyberspace somewhere, so I will acknowledge it and I'll post it as soon as possible. Um, what else? Um, Monday, of course, is the, the last day of class. That is June 1st. We'll have both. It's gonna be a packed morning or afternoon, whatever. Actually, for you guys, it'll be a packed morning. Um, we'll have both the lecture and lab exams that day. Um, Speaking of the lab exams, um, I will be posting a practice exam sometime in the middle of the week. If anyone has any questions about it, <clears throat> you, you kind of know how <clears throat> my lab exams are organized. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. It's going to be basically similar, you know, a combination of models um, as well as um, histology. So digestive, urinary, and reproductive. And just like the other lab exams, that will be worth 50 points. Um, so last day is June 1st. So because you know everyone, every, all the grades are already kind of posted as we go along, uh, it shouldn't take me long to um, come out with your final grades. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through and make sure everything is, is on there, nothing's been missed and it should be posted soon thereafter. And um, that should be it. Um, are there any questions before we start? Nope. All right. Okay, so let's dive into, let me make sure, hold on a second here, stop share. Yes, we are going, okay. Let's go into, make sure. All right, so today is the second half of the reproductive system. Last time we covered male reproductive system. Today we're going to cover female. It's going to be uh, structured very much the same. We'll go through a little background as far as overall functions, 
then get into some of the specifics about the different parts of the female reproductive tract, what their role is, what their function is. And then we'll get into some really what I would call physiology, because now that we've covered male and female, then we can get into things like fertilization, pregnancy, and some of the, the um, processes in that area. Okay, so female reproductive system, what is the function of it? Well, basically one of the couple of the functions are listed here. First one is the fact that it produces gametes. Much like the, rail, uh, the male reproductive system produces gametes, in that case, it's sperm. In the case of the female reproductive system, it also produces gametes, and that would be eggs or ova. And of course, as you guys know, the eggs are actually produced in this structure, which we'll take a look at shortly, which is the ovary. Um, <coughs> there are other structures that are very important. Um, another function of the re reproductive tract is assuming an egg is fertilized. Um, and an embryo starts developing, there has to be a place where it's housed, where it can develop. And the female reproductive tract, primarily the uterus, is the site where this developing embryo, eventually a fetus, can actually develop. The female reproductive tract, the structures of it are, are really designed to undergo cyclical changes. When I mean cyclical changes, and this is in line with the menstrual cycle, um, which is a monthly cycle, which in, during this cycle, there are changes in the reproductive tract that essentially prepare the reproductive tract in case an egg is fertilized. And if there is no egg that's fertilized, there's other there's changes that occur in that particular case. So we'll talk about some of the changes, the cyclical changes, which is very different from the male reproductive tract, right? There is There are no cyclical changes with the male. Basically, sperm start to develop, takes about 75 days, it goes through kind of nonstop, whereas the female, there's, there's several different events that are occurring. Now, what are the main structures we're going to be taking a look at today? First would be the ovaries, which are the, which we have, there are two of them. Connected to the ovaries are what we call the uterine tubes. Um, these are also known as in the literature, fallopian tubes. And these are, if you want to kind of look at comparisons, the testes are like the ovaries in the sense that those are the sites for gametes to develop. The uterine tube is similar to what I would say would be the vas deferens, which is where in the case, that's where the sperm are transported. In this case, this is where the eggs are transported. Next, we have the uterus, which is a very muscular structure where a fertilized egg can develop, but also some other interesting cyclical changes. And then is the vagina, otherwise known as the birth canal. So we'll take a look in more detail as far as the functions of these different regions. So this is a sagittal view of the female reproductive tract, much like you'd see in the, in the models in lab. Uh, we take a look at some of those, the pictures of them. Um, here you can see the vagina. Here is the uterus. Here is the uterine or the fallopian tube, and this would be the ovary. And of course, this is really one half because we have on the other side another ovary and another uterine tube. There is also this structure called the clitoris, which is comparable in terms of structure and, and other features to the male penis. And the fact that it's an erectile organ. Okay, so much like in the male, we started off talking about really the factory where the gametes are developing. We'll do the same thing with the female. Um, the gametes in the, are developing in the ovaries. Now, when I say the gametes are developing, if you were to look inside an ovary, what would you see? You would see many of these structures right here, which are known as follicles. Now, follicles are 
are a structure which consists of a central cell, in this case, the egg, which is this right here. There's the nucleus. There's the egg itself. Surrounded by many of these small nuclei, which are, no, which, um, are part of what we call follicular cells. And we'll take a look at those, what their function is. So a follicle is an egg that's surrounded by these cells, which kind of serve a protective role of the egg. It's also this follicle that ruptures at the time of ovulation, releasing this egg into the fallopian tube, whereas these remaining cells remain in the ovary. All right, so let's take a detailed look at a follicle. Now, one of the things we'll learn as we go along is that follicles, all follicles are not the same. Um, depending on what stage of development in the cycle, um, follicles can be very small. We'll call them primordial. You'll see that later. Then we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and then we have ovulation. But just generally speaking for now, a follicle consists of this ovum, which is surrounded by several layers. Um, first we have, which looks like it was drawn by a Sharpie, this dark layer, which is the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is very important. First of all, it's, it's a membrane that surrounds the egg, but also it's the last barrier that sperm have to pass through prior to fertilizing it. And we'll take a look at some events that the sperm undergo that allow it to fertilize an egg. So this is actually an important boundary. Outside of the zona pellucida, you can see it looks like we've got a group of cells right here that look one way. Then we've got this layer. This is called the granulosa layer, which are, these are all follicular cells, right? These are all kind of these cells, but they're made up of two different types. We have the granulosa cells on the inside and the theca cells on the outside. Now, I'm just going to mention to you right now, um, functionally, these are responsible for producing the steroid hormones. These cells are responsible for producing estrogen, the granulosa cells. And the outer cells, the theca, produce testosterone. Which you think, wait a minute, females produce testosterone? Yes, they do. It's just smaller amounts than males. Um, conversely, males also produce estrogen, but less than females. So theca produce testosterone, granulosa produce estrogen. Now you might wonder, what about progesterone? Well, that's after ovulation, and we'll take a look at what types of cells produce um, progesterone. All right. So let's kind of zoom in on the ovaries, a little bit more detail about them and how they're placed within the reproductive tract. Um, the reproductive tract, as you can see right here, consists not only of these structures that I was talking about, the vagina, the uterus, the uterine tubes, and the ovaries, but also it looks like these membranes. You can see one side here. They're also on the other side. They just left them out. These, um, these are ligaments. Um, we call them ligaments. They're not like bone-to-bone -bone ligaments, but they're, they, they connect different structures to kind of hold the reproductive tract in place. We have three main ligaments. We have what's known as the broad ligament, and you can see this one which actually kind of extends, actually pretty much extends throughout a good portion of this, but we have the broad ligament. We have also what's known as the suspensory ligament, which is up here. And we have what's known as the ovarian ligament, which you can see, get a better view of it right here. So this is the ovarian ligament, this thin bit, which kind of connects it, the ovary to the uterus. This is the, the um, suspensory ligament that suspends the reproductive tract in the pelvic cavity. 
And this is the broad ligament, which pretty much extends all the way down. Um, and this is really important for kind of holding everything in place. So three main ligaments. We also have blood vessels. Um, and much like with the testes, remember we have arteries and veins. In females, the, the arteries are known as ovarian arteries. We also have nerves, um, much like with the male, we have the autonomic nervous system, which innervates the male reproductive tract. We also have the ANS that innervates the female reproductive tract. And you can't really see the, um, you can't see the nerves in this picture. All right. So this is a photomicrograph of an ovary. And when you look at it, it's kind of, it first looks kind of unremarkable. You see uh, this kind of dense area, and then you see these various sized structures, right? <clears throat> um, well, first of all, the um, ovary is surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called the tunica albuginea, kind of like the capsule. That's kind of the outer layer. Underneath that, we have two distinct regions. We have this outer portion of the ovary, which is known as the cortex. If you guys remember <clears throat> when we're talking about <clears throat> the, ki the kidney, excuse me, <clears throat> um, we spoke about the cortex and the medulla. So the cortex is where we find um, most of the follicles, <clears throat> most of the developing follic follicles which contain oocytes. Now, one of the things that you'll learn the term, what are, what, are, what are oocytes? Oocytes is just another name for this egg that's in the middle. So in this picture, it's hard to see because it's very microscopic, but you can see different sizes, very small and very large. The different sizes of follicles that contain developing oocytes are found in the cortex. In the medulla, which is this area, is where we have most of the blood vessels and nerves and um, maybe some of the later stage follicles, but most of the follicles are contained within the cortex. These names where it says mature follicle, secondary follicle, primary follicle, we're going to take a look at these because these are follicles that are at different stages during the, the female menstrual cycle. And as the menstrual cycle proceeds, we'll find some follicles start to enlarge into secondary and then become mature. And then eventually during ovulation, the mature follicle will rupture. But we'll cover that in, in detail. All I want you to know right now is that the follicles are found in the cortex and the medulla contains the blood vessels and nerves. All right. Moving from the ovary, and again, we'll go back to the ovary because we're going to talk a bit about how eggs develop, but I just wanted to give you a general structure of the ovary. Um, now let's move into the fallopian or the uterine tubes. Uterine tubes are involved in a couple of different things. Number one, this is where a egg <clears throat> following ovulation during the menstrual cycle is ovulated into. It's released into the fallopian tube where it's transported. Now it's transported, and if you think of, of where it has to go, it has to go from the ovary, right, all the way down to the uterus. So how does it get there? Well, it's dependent upon a couple key structures. Number one, we have simple columnar ciliated epithelium that, and of course cilia, as we know, move. They kind of sweep, right? When are they sweeping? They're sweeping the egg. And it takes several days for the egg to go from the ovary to the fallopian tubes, maybe three, four days. So it helps to sweep it, but what helps with that movement is also this underlying smooth muscle. Much like with the vas deferens, where that vas deferens was very muscular and contracted to help to move the sperm, the smooth muscle of the fallopian tube helps to move the egg along with the ciliated epithelium. So that's one very important function of the fallopian tube is transporting the egg. 
Another important role, it's also the site of fertilization. Now, if an egg, in, in a normal menstrual cycle, of course, the egg is transported down to the uterus. And if, but if an egg is fertilized, it's typically fertilized in the fallopian tube. And then it moves down. So it's also, so the fallopian tube or the uterine tube is also the site for fertilization. Some features of the uterine tube, um, even though it looks like one structure, there are distinct parts to it. The part that's really adjacent to the ovary is known as the infundibulum, which has these little finger-like projections called fimbriae. It's kind of hard to see it. Actually, this is a better view of it. These are the fimbriae. This is the infundibulum. And when an egg is ovulated, it's ejected, and it actually is a forceful process. It's ejected into the infundibulum, where it moves down from the infundibulum um, to the isthmus. I'm sorry, right there. In between the infundibulum and the isthmus is this enlarged area, which is the ampulla. And the ampulla is the site for fertilization, or at least that's where it should be. Um, there are some times where an egg is fertilized in maybe another area, but the ideal spot where it should be fertilized is right there in the ampule. All right, so this is more of a close-up view. You can see the ovary. Here are the fimbria. This is the infundibulum. This is the ampulla where fertilization typically takes place. And then we have the isthmus. Isthmus is another name for kind of a narrow region. If you think of those of you that have ever been to Catalina, there's a region called the isthmus, which is like a narrow pathway through the island. This, of course, is the uterus, which we'll be taking a look at later. So the egg is, if an egg is ovulated during the cycle, it travels down through the uterine tube, eventually reaching the uterus. Here we can see the ciliated epithelium, which is what, again, using the term mucosa. Remember, mucosa is just another name for cells that are lining a cavity. Underneath that, we have the smooth muscle layer, um, which is sometimes referred to as the muscularis, but you can just call it smooth muscle. All right. So if we kind of follow the path of an egg, it develops in the ovary, travels through the uterine tube, reaches the uterus. Um, the uterus is considered to be in what's called an antiverted stage, um, where it's located just anterior to the rectum. That's the normal position. Some women have a uterus that's everted or in a different position, and sometimes that can cause a problem, and doctors sometimes have to actually um, adjust the position of the uterus. Now, the uterus, much like the uterine tube, has several regions, three really main regions. This upper portion, so this whole area is the uterus, this upper portion is the what we call the fundus or the fundic region. Remember the fundic stomach, which kind of is above the esophagus. This right here is kind of above the entry of the uterine tube. This is the fundus. The bulk of the uterus is called the body. Remember the body of the stomach. It's the central portion. Next, we get into another region which has its own name called the cervix, but the cervix is actually part of the uterus. And this area, now even though the entire reproductive tract undergoes cyclical changes in growth and development, the, change, the cyclical changes that occur through the cycle in the cervix are involved in the production of mucus. Um, during different stages of the menstrual cycle, the mucus has various, um, um, is, is some areas it's thicker than others. 
typically during the most fertile stages of the cycle, it's thinner. During the more non-fertile stages, it's thicker, which actually interferes with the, the sperm transport. It acts as an impediment. In addition to that role, during pregnancy, there's what we call the mucus plug. And there's actually a plug that develops here, a thick kind of a, 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 a part of mucus that allows the developing fetus to undergo its development in relative isolation from the outside world. If you think of the outside world as down here, it allows the fetus to be protected from any pathogens that could possibly work their way through the vagina up through the uterus. And normally this mucus plug persists until just prior to the onset of labor. Um, in some individuals, the mucus plug can be ejected or slip out before that. Um, and that can potentially be problematic because it kind of can open up this area to infection. Within the cervix, we have three areas. We have this kind of a narrow portion, which is called the internal os. We have the area that opens up into the vagina called the external os. And in between, we have the cervical canal. When someone has a pap smear, this is the area that's examined for potential cervical cancer. Um, this is actually an actual a photograph of the cervix. This is the, this is the external os. All right, so a little bit more detail of the uterus. Um, I've already mentioned we have three regions. We have the fundus, we have the body, and we have the um, cervix. However, histologically, in all areas of the uterus, we have um, three layers of tissue. So even though this is the body, and this is the fundus, and this is the cervix, each region is made up of three histological layers. The outside layer, very thin, is known as the um, parametrium, which is no, no different than the serous peritoneum. You know, we've talked about serous layers, visceral peritoneum, um, parietal peritoneum, things like that. Well, this is part of that peritoneum. Underneath that, the thickest layer is the myometrium. Anytime you hear the term myo, it means muscle. Um, this is smooth muscle. And this is the, the musculature of the uterus system has two very important functions. Its primary function is during the onset of labor where this muscle contracts that helps to expel the baby but has a secondary role in the fact that it does, it can help smaller contractions, can help in moving sperm up the reproductive tract to hopefully fertilize an egg in the ampulla of the uterine Finally, the innermost layer, this is the layer in the uterus that undergoes the greatest amount of cyclical changes other than the mucus of the cervix. Um, this is the endometrium. This undergoes change. It's first of all, it's epithelium. It's simple columnar epithelium, um, non ciliated. Um, and this undergoes growth and discharge during different parts of the menstrual cycle. We'll talk about that. So when someone is menstruating, it's this layer that is lost and then it grows back and then it's lost again each month unless pregnancy occurs, then it remains. And we'll talk about that. All right, so this is, again, some histology of the endometrium, as well as some of the myometrium. Um, this would be the lumen of the uterus. So we're looking at this layer right there, this region. This is the lumen. Here we have the endometrium. And I don't know if you can see, it's really kind of low magnification, but you can see a lot of, looks like coiling. Um, this is a very glandular tissue. A lot of, obviously it's all simple columnar epithelium. 
But what I, I wanted to point out a couple things. First of all, that the endometrium consists of two layers. It's really hard to kind of divide where one starts and one finishes, but let's just say for here, the, this part is known as the functionalis of the endometrium. This is the outermost layer. Now, why is this significant? This is the part of the endometrium that grows and is shed during menstruation. What remains during menstruation is this part, which is the basalis. Because if you think about it, if the entire endometrium was shed, there wouldn't be anything left to grow back. So we've got to have this. Kind of like with sperm, remember I mentioned about spermatogonia, that if all the spermatogonia develop into sperm, there's nothing left to make new sperm. So that's why some of the spermatogonia make more spermatogonia, right? We talked about type A, type B. Same thing here. So, and that we sometimes call it the functional layer, the functionalis, and the basal layer. This is the myometrium, the smooth muscle. All right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about blood supply for a couple reasons. Um, number one, that just kind of knowing what the arteries are but also, too, the role they play in the cycle, um, in, the, in the menstrual cycle, okay? So this is another view of the endometrium. Here's the functionalis layer. Here's the basalis layer. As far as the blood supply, the blood supply of the uterus starts off with the uterine artery, right, which branches off into a couple main types. First of all, the initial branch is known as the radial artery which as you can see goes right through the smooth muscle. And then as it enters into the endometrium, it branches further into the straight arteries and then eventually into these coiled arteries, which are called spiral arteries. I wanted to mention these spiral arteries especially because it's the activity of these vessels that are very instrumental in, in the cycle. For example, during, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more, but during the growth phase of the menstrual cycle, when the endometrium is growing, we sometimes call that the proliferative stage, but, but, stage, but you'll learn more about that. These blood vessels are developing too, right? Because the more tissue, you've got to have a better blood supply. But what happens is, just prior to menstruation, these blood vessels constrict. The spiral arteries constrict, which will cause this tissue to die, at least the functionalis layer. It will be shed, and then it'll grow back. So it's the activity of the spiral arteries that's under hormonal influence, of course, that determines the... Um, growth and degeneration of the endometrium. All right, the other reason I wanted to mention the blood vessels is that they play a very important role in a condition known as uterine fibroids. Some of you might be familiar with this from your own experience or maybe a relative. Um, uterine fibroids are tumors. They're not cancerous, but just because they're not cancerous doesn't mean that they don't cause problems. They can, depending upon where they are, this is, of course, the myometrium. Here's the uterine tube. Here's the uterus. Um, they can interfere with fertilization, impair the ability of sperm to get through. They could also interfere um, with implantation. Once an egg is implant, uh, fertilized, normally it implants in the uterus. Um, so what, what is the significance of the blood vessels? Well, fibroids, like any tumor, right, require an extensive blood supply. You know, because they're rapidly growing, they need a lot of blood vessels, blood, good blood supply. One of the, there's a couple of different ways to treat a fibroid. One, of course, doctor can go in surgically and have the fibroids removed. Another procedure is there's a couple of them. One is uh, hormone treatment, but a third is an infusion of a catheter through the femoral artery 
eventually into the uterine artery, eventually into, into these branches. And that catheter contains small little plastic beads. And you might think injecting plastic into you, that doesn't sound good. Well, these plastic beads, their, their initial function is to block the blood supply of the fibroids. So doctors are doing this. They've got a camera and they can see what's going on. These plastic beads block the influx of blood to a tumor, causing the tumors to shrink and eventually, in some cases, completely disappear or die off. The plastic beads are then actually um, broken down and are eliminated in waste. They don't build up inside the body. So um, it's a very, um, I don't say popular treatment, but it is obviously much less invasive than an actual surgery or the tumors are removed. All right. Moving from the uterus to the vagina, vagina has a couple functions. Number one, it's the birth canal. It also receives the penis during intercourse. Um, and it's based upon the, the fact that it's a birth canal. It has to have the ability to enlarge. And what allows that to happen are the presence of rugae. And I don't know if you can see it here very well. Let's see. No, you can't see it. Uh, maybe you can see, it looks like these, this ribbing, these ridges, uh, much like the rugae in the stomach, which allow the, the stomach to expand when it's filling up with food and, and very active. These rugae allow the vagina to expand when a baby is there, during childbirth. Epithelial-wise, it's an interesting word, epithelial-wise, but anyway, um, it consists of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, this is a part of the body that, again, there could be it, it, things going through it. For example, a baby can be very abrasive. This prevents damage to underlying tissue. Much like with the esophagus, remember, that's non-keratinized stratified squamous. Because food is not yet broken down. Food can be abrasive or harsh, and it can damage underlying tissue. Non-keratinized stratified squamous has a very protective role. Underneath the stratified squamous, we have smooth muscle, and then we have what's called an, ad an adventitia. Um, where it says transverse folds in the mucosa, that's just another name for the rugae. All right, let me see how I'm doing here. All right, we started at 8.30, so we're good. All right, so that takes us through really the, the reproductive tract, really the main structure that I wanted to focus on. Now we're going to go back to the ovary and take a look at egg development. All right, and the process of egg development, so what I'm talking about here is not really the menstrual cycle per se, it's just egg development, and I'll explain what I mean by that. It's called oogenesis. Much like spermatogenesis, remember in the male, spermatogenesis begins at puberty. In the case of the female, egg development starts occurring in a female fetus in utero. And what we, so if you were to examine the, the ovary of a female fetus, sometime during pregnancy, when she's in her mother, you'd find that her ovaries contain a lot of follicles, right, that consist of what we call uh, primary oocytes. Well, actually, before I get to that, let me focus on here, okay? So we have this pool of stem cells in the ovary called oogonium. Remember, we also had a pool of stem cells in the um, testes called spermatogonium. They undergo mitosis to form what are called primary oocytes. Remember in the male, spermatogonium undergo mitosis to form primary spermatocytes. Here's the oogonium, they undergo mitosis to form primary oocytes, okay? Though the, those primary oocytes stay around, they grow a bit inside the, the follicles, but they're still primary oocytes. 
it's not until just prior to ovulation that we see the first meiotic division, meiosis one, in which a primary oocyte divides to form a secondary oocyte, right? So there's the primary oocyte, there's the secondary oocyte. All right, so we have the oogonium that are undergoing mitosis to form primary oocytes. Those primary oocytes stay in the ovary until that egg is about ready to be ovulated to form a secondary oocyte. Now, that's the first meiotic division. What about the second one, right? The second meiotic division does not occur until that egg is fertilized. So if you think about it, an ovary has millions and millions of oocytes. During the process of a typical reproductive lifespan, depending on when someone starts having their period, you think of maybe 30, maybe 40 years of a reproductive lifespan, not all of the eggs are going to ovulate. So many eggs in the ovary stay as a primary oocyte, right? Only typically one egg a month becomes a secondary oocyte. And even fewer than that becomes a, um, what we call a zygote, which is the second stage of meiosis. So that's different from sperm, right? With sperm, we have spermatogonium, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermatid, and then um, spermatozoa. In females, we have oogonium, primary spermatis, uh, primary oocyte, secondary oocyte, and then zygote, which is another name for fertilized egg, All right? So just to kind of retract, the, the process of oogenesis is a bit more tightly regulated. It, just, it doesn't just go through nonstop. There's these checkpoints, right? Uh, oogonium divides to form primary oocytes, right? Stay that way. An egg that's selected to ovulate becomes a secondary oocyte. An egg that is fertilized becomes a zygote. And that only occurs at fertilization. This is a bit more detail. Um, and just to kind of illustrate, so this is what we're looking at here. But just to let you know, um, these primary oocytes are all contained within follicles, right? As we mentioned before. Now the follicles, depending on the size of the egg, they're, all the eggs you see in the ovary are going to be either oogonium or primary oocytes, right? Secondary oocytes are not gonna be inside the ovary. Those primary oocytes are surrounded by follicular cells and depending on what stage of development, they're either going to be in a primary follicle, secondary follicle, or what we call an antral or a mature follicle. All right. Hopefully that's clear. If not, you can yeah, ask, ask me some questions, but it's really an interesting sort of a checkpoint. All right. So that's the process of oogenesis begins um, in utero. Um, now, one thing to remember, of course, is that when we think of when ovulation occurs, ovul the first ovulation doesn't occur until a female reaches puberty, right? So you have all these eggs that are basically in a, as a primary oocyte until one finally starts ovulates at puberty. And that's when we start getting into the menstrual cycle, right? Now the menstrual cycle, it's all you know, a monthly cycle, but I'm going to divide it up into two parts. Even though it's one cycle, we're going to take a look at events that are occurring in the ovaries and events that are occurring in the uterus. Um, they correspond to each other because the uterine cycle depends on the ovarian cycle and vice versa. But I'm going to mention them separately because it's important to see what's going on in each, and then we'll combine them. All right. So first of all, let's take a look at the ovarian cycle. Again, it's the menstrual cycle, but it's what's happening during the, in the ovaries. This is a diagram of an ovary. 
And what, are the, what do I want to show? It's, it can look somewhat complicated, but first of all, I want to draw, draw a, make believe you're drawing a line across like this. We have this top half and then the bottom half. The top half refers to ovarian changes that are occurring during the first half of the cycle. Now, if you think of a menstrual cycle, on average, it's about 28 days. Um, it varies from one individual to the other, but on average, it's 28 days. So what's going on in the first 14 is what you see on top. The second 14 are the bottom. The first 14 days are known as the follicular phase. Now, why is it called the follicular phase? Because the follicles are growing. Now, if we take a look here, these are all primary oocytes. They're all actually primary oocytes, right? Because that's all you have. You only have primary oocytes in the ovary, but they're contained within initially a primary follicle, as it grows, it becomes a secondary follicle, still an oocyte, primary oocyte, but the cells around it are growing. <clears throat> as it gets close to maturity or ovulation, it becomes a mature follicle, and then it ovulates. This is called a follicular phase, and this is primarily hormonally under the influence of estrogen. So estrogen is the dominating hormone during the first 14 days. Then we have ovulation that occurs right around day 14, but again, it can, it can vary within a couple days. After ovulation, we have what's called the luteal phase. It's called the luteal phase because we have these yellow structures which are called corpus luteum. Corpus luteum literally means yellow body, this is what is left, and this is what the follicular cells, see these follicular cells that are surrounding the, 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 over, the oocyte? When an, when an egg is ovulated, the egg leaves, most of what's left of the follicular cells remain, and they transform into this yellow body called the corpus luteum. What is the significance of the corpus luteum? The corpus luteum produ produces copious amounts of progesterone. So if you wonder, it's like, where does progesterone come from? Mostly in the ovary. It's primarily from the corpus luteum. So first 14 days follicular phase under the influence of, of estrogen, um, follicles grow. Now, this happens to be showing kind of a follicle growing. I want to emphasize that not all follicles grow during a menstrual cycle. Maybe only a couple are selected because there's millions of follicles depending on the age of the female, um, and only a few are selected to grow. Typically, only one ovulates. The second half is the corpus, it is where corpus luteum becomes active, it produces progesterone. Progesterone has a very important function in preparing the uterus for pregnancy. Now, granted, there may not be a pregnancy, but it prepares it for it, and I'll explain what that means. If no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum degenerates. And when the corpus luteum degenerates, that eventually will lead to the sloughing off of the endometrium, and the cycle starts all over again. All right, so the ovarian cycle consists of three parts, follicular, ovulation, and then the luteal phase. A um, little bit more detail about this, um, and some of this we've already covered. Um, these are the stages of the follicles. Um, we have all of these contain primary oocytes in the middle. But as a follicle grows during the first 14 days, you can see these follicular cells grow. And remember I mentioned we have fecal cells, fecal cells and granulosa cells, right, that are involved. All right, so what stimulates the growth? So early on when we were talking about male, reproductive, male reproduction, I mentioned a couple hormones. 
um, besides the testosterone at the testes, I mentioned FSH and LH. Remember that? Well, remember in the male, FSH stimulates spermatogenesis, right? In females, FSH stimulates growth of these follicles, right? It stimulates the follicle to grow. And in fact, FSH does stand for follicle stimulating hormone. So when this hormone was first discovered, it was discovered in females. Um, now, even though males produce it, males don't make follicles, but the name stuck. So, um, so FSH stimulates these follicles to grow. Um, I also mentioned, of course, in a typical follicle, we have what's called that zona pellucida, which is going to be very prominent. Um, as you can see, well, you can see it not too well here. You can see it a bit clearer right there, even though it's in, there it is there, and there it is there. All right, that's going to be something that's important when a sperm fertilizes an egg. And then we've got the theca and then the granulosa. You can see the theca out here and the granulosa. Don't worry about the theca interna and externa. I'm not going to get into that detail, but just know theca and granulosa. All right. So theca and granulosa, remember I mentioned that the theca cells produce testosterone, right? And I mentioned the granulosas make estrogen. So let's talk about hormones again. So I mentioned that, the, that um, FSH stimulates follicular growth, which is true. But it also has a secondary role of stimulating conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Now, how does that occur? The theca cells, which are these out here, produce testosterone under the influence of the hormone LH. Remember, LH in males produces testosterone, stimulates production of testosterone by the Leydig cells. In this case, LH in, in females stimulates testosterone production in the theca cells. The thec once testosterone is made, it travels to the granulosa cells, and then FSH stimulates the granulosa cells to convert testosterone into estrogen. So it's a nice partnership that occurs. Aromatase is just the name of the enzyme in that uh, converts testosterone into estrogen. Wait, did I? How did I do that twice? Oh, no, we're just... Okay, never mind. I just didn't finish. Okay. Um, we're just at a different part. So we left off with, sorry, right here. Um, these cells, we spoke about the growth of the follicle. Then as we get to later stages, obviously the secondary follicle, this large follicle is known as the graphene follicle. Now you'll see it in some books. It's either called an antral follicle or a mature follicle. All I want you to know is this is the, the latest stage of a follicle prior to this egg being ovulated. All right. Um, the corona radiata, it's not shown here, but don't worry about that. That's just a layer of cells that stays, just sticks around. But um, just know, don't worry about the corona radiata. What I do want you to know, though, is that there's a, even though the egg, as the follicle grows, you notice that we start developing these spaces, right? This space and this large cavity, where we really didn't have it here. This enlarged cavity is due to fluid building up, which eventually puts pressure to cause the ovulation. The only thing that's left attached to the ovary is this little connection of follicular cells known as the cumulus oophorus. Cumulus oophorus. All right. Then, as I mentioned, we have ovulation. Um, fi when finally, an egg reaches the graphene follicle stage. Sorry about that. Um, then around day, that takes about 14 days. At day 14, that graphene or mature follicle ruptures. 
in that follicle then um, is swept, I'm sorry, that, that egg, not the entire follicle, the egg is swept into the uterine tube or the, the fallopian tube. Now, hormonally, what, what triggers ovulation? Well, what's interesting is this, we have, I mentioned there's two hormones that play a role in reproduction in, from the pituitary. Remember, FSH triggers egg development, <clears throat> but it also in, triggers production of estrogen. LH stimulates testosterone production. But I would say probably the most important function of LH is that it also triggers ovulation. So LH is the ovulation hormone. So if someone is interested in getting pregnant, they want to find how close they are to ovulation, you go into a pharmacy, the ovulation test kit actually measures LH. So if the LH levels are starting to increase, that's an indication that you're close to ovulation. So LH is the ovulation hormone that's used in the test, that's measured in the test kits in addition to stimulating testosterone production, whereas FSH stimulates the growth of the follicles and it also stimulates estrogen production. All right, so after ovulation, as I mentioned, we have what's called the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum makes progesterone. And as I mentioned, progesterone is very important in preparing the uterus for an egg, a fertilized egg that will eventually be implanted. If that, if pregnancy does not occur, there's no fertilized egg, there's no implantation, um, the corpus luteum will regress, degenerate, and eventually become what's called the corpus albicans. So if you think it albi sounds like albino, it become, goes from a yellow body into a white body. It doesn't show it here, but it's what's called the corpus albicans. So the progression is, if you think of Follicular development, we have primary, secondary, mature follicles, then the egg ovulates, we have corpus luteum, and then we have corpus albicans. Then the cycle starts over again. All right, this is just a cool picture just to show you. I hope it's kind of small, but hopefully you can see it. Um, here's, a primary, here, here's a primary follicle which is preceded by a primordial follicle, primary follicle, secondary follicle, tertiary or, 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 or growing follicle, and then we have what's called the graphene. This is the graphene or mature follicle. In this case, they gave it four, five stages. Mostly it's just given four. We really don't talk about this one much. This is all under the control of FSH. And remember, these are all primary eggs, primary oocytes. The only, the follicles are, different follicles are due to the growth in the follicular cells. This is the actual rupture or the explosive, and it really is explosive. Um, there are some videos, you could probably go to YouTube, where doctors have actually been able to make, take movies of the process of ovulation, where the egg is ejected. And then there's our corpus luteum. I don't think they have, yeah. All right. Um, this is just another picture showing, for example, the structural changes that are occurring at the ovary. These are, the, these are all the different follicular cells, a lot of them. Couple are selected to grow. You can see most of them do not grow. This one begins to dominate, grow, ovulates, and then we got the corpus luteum and then that degenerates. At the same time all that's occurring at the ovary, events are taking place in the uterus. And we call this the, the uterine cycle. There are cyclical changes that are occurring primarily in the endometrium that are also directed or under the influence of FSH and LH, kind of indirectly. The uterine cycle as three phases, what we call the menstrual phase, where the functional layer is functionalis, is shed of the endometrium. We have the proliferative phase, which is where the functional layer grows. 
And then we have the secretory layer, which is day 50 to 28. No, so if you want to draw a comparison between what's going on in the uterus and the ovary, the proliferative stage occurs around the same time as the egg is developing, as the follicular stage. So the follicular stage in the ovary is somewhat comparable to the timing of the proliferative stage. The luteal phase is occurring roughly at the same time as the secretory phase. So that's kind of to give you an idea of what's occurring. All right. Now, just to kind of give you an idea before we go into the um, uterine stages, um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the hormones. Um, and as you can see, the as we go through the, the, the stages of the cycle, I wanted to just point out one main thing. Even though there are changes that occur during the cycle with FSH and LH, most of the activity of FSH occur roughly right around the time of ovulation. FSH levels have their last peak, which causes the last stage of development, and then LH triggers ovulation. So this is all roughly at around day 14. This is where the principle, even though FSH level, you can't really see it, but FSH has an important role here. It starts to spike around day 14. This is around day 14 at the same time that LH is spiking. All right. Another thing I want to point out, and we'll eventually put this all together. This is the... Uh, Follicular phase in blue. This is the luteal phase in, I don't know what color you call that. Remember I mentioned estrogen dominates prior to ovulation. After ovulation, even though we still have estrogen, progesterone dominates. Remember, remember this is coming primarily from the corpus luteum. And the estrogen peaks are coming really from the granulosa cells. All right, so let's take a look at the structural changes that are occurring in the endometrium. Um, as you can see, the, we have the menstrual proliferative phase and the secretory phase, all right? And I'm gonna put this all together. It, it might be a little bit confusing right now, but at the end, hopefully you'll see how it, they all correspond. Um, even though the menstrual phase is first, I'm actually gonna start with the proliferative phase because that kind of corresponds to the growth of the follicles. So the proliferative phase is where the functional layer grows, the functional layer of the endometrium. And this is primarily under the influence of FSH as well as estrogen. Why is the functionalis layer growing? Because, again, the uterus is preparing in case the developing egg ovulates and is fertilized. After ovulation, we have what's called the secretory phase. And you can see we get further development of the endometrium, but we also start to see a lot of development of blood vessels. This is called the secretory phase because the endometrium is not only growing, but it becomes very glandular, secreting substances that are going to help support that embryo if, in fact, it implants. It's basically it's preparing a nice little bed for that embryo to arrive at. All right. If there is no, um, if there is no implantation, if the egg isn't fertilized. Progesterone, which is dominant here, right, because this would be comparable to the luteal phase, decreases because the corpus luteum shrinks. As the corpus luteum shrinks, the endometrium then is shed, which is the menstrual phase. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look with this, how this appears microscopically. <clears throat> We have the proliferative phase, which is under the influence of FSH and estrogen, which influence the proliferation of the stratum functionalis cells. 
Remember, this is all occurring at the same time that the follicles in the ovary are developing. And we start to see a lot of this coiled glandular epithelium. They start to develop. We start to see arteries becoming a bit more extensive. If um, <clears throat> um, this is during fo the follicular phase, after ovulation, progesterone, remember, which is being produced by the corpus luteum, along with LH, start fur causing further development of these glands. They become actively seek secreting a lot of growth factors, a lot of substances to help nourish the expected implanted um, embryo. Arteries start to develop even further. If no pregnancy occurs, corpus, the corpus luteum shrinks. Why does the corpus, so corpus luteum shrinks, which causes a decrease in progesterone. When progesterone shrinks, this causes a vasoconstriction or a shrinkage in those spiral arteries. When those spiral arteries shrink, that means the functionalis is not getting nourishment. When they're not getting nourishment, those cells will die, right? Because of the backlog, because there's vasoconstriction, event. This causes a lot of pressure. Eventually, those blood vessels will burst, which explains the pattern of menstrual flow. The epithelium or the functionalis is carried out by way of the loss of blood. <laughs> all right, so this is everything in one diagram. So hopefully this will all put it all together for you. Um, here we've got the pituitary hormones up here. Here we've got the follicles developing at the ovary. Here we've got the hormones being produced by the um, grand, uh, um, follicular cells. And here we have the endometrium. You can see, for example, we have the follicular phase where we're starting to see eggs developing, primarily under the influence of FSH, right? As the eggs start to develop, they start producing estrogen, which causes the endometrium to start to thicken. There's the proliferative phase, right? As the eggs begin to grow further, estrogen levels get even higher and higher. As and the endometrium gets thicker, eventually we reach a stage where the eggs are, remember it's grown, this follicle develops, it becomes a graphene follicle. It ruptures under the influence primarily of LH, which is the spike, as well as FSH, but really LH is the ovulation hormone, causing the release of the egg, formation of the corpus luteum, which causes the, which starts producing a lot of progesterone, which causes the endometrium to cause it un to undergo further development, but also become very glandular, secreting a lot of substances that are going to help sustain the expected embryo that's going to arrive. If the ovulated egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum shrinks, which causes a decrease in progesterone, which will ultimately lead to that vasoconstriction, which will cause the sloughing off, which occurs during menstruation. So that's really everything in a nutshell. And hopefully that's um, helpful for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to let me know. I'm just gonna do one more slide here to kind of summarize the endocrine control of the um, ovarian cycle. So to, to kind of take a look at the big picture, I wanted to include a couple interesting things. Those of you guys that are taking physiology, um, we've spoken a lot about feedback loops, right? Um, for the rest of you, I'll kind of bring you up to speed and, and how that relates to the ovarian cycle and why an egg develops. Um, first of all, let's take a look. This is a nice diagram showing hormonal control of the ovarian cycle which is the ovarian portion of the menstrual cycle. This blue part is the follicular phase. This green part is the luteal phase. 
the cycle begins by an increase in FSH, right? We all agree on that, right? An FSH travels to the ovary and start, gets the follicles to start to develop, right? And the follicles start to produce estrogen. Well, one of the things, normally when we talk about physiology, typically as something goes up, it brings it down. You know, typically we have mechanisms that, for example, if our blood sugar gets too high, we have hormones like insulin that lower it. Or if, we, if our water level in our body is too low, we have hormones such as ADH, which will bring it up. Roxy. Sorry. Well, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, um, but just to sort of kind of bring you up to speed and physiology, we'll go over this a bit more. One of the reasons why the follicles continue to grow as opposed to getting smaller is because estrogen has a positive feedback that triggers the LH surge. So FSH triggers follicular growth which causes an increase in estrogen, and estrogen causes more FSH, more LH. This is what we call a positive feedback loop, and that surge eventually triggers ovulation, right? Then once ovulation occurs, um, progesterone levels go up. Remember, if there's no um, fertilization, the progesterone levels will decrease, and then progesterone levels decrease, this causes menstruation. So if this diagram's a bit confusing, there's a couple things you should re uh, know from it. Number one, increased FSH starts the cycle, eggs develop, right? Estrogen produced, we already know that. Um, that estrogen triggers a positive feedback, which causes more FSH, more LH, eventually causing ovulation. And the rest of the story, of course, you know from these previous diagrams. All right, so let me just see where we're at. I think I know where we're at. We are on slide 34. Yeah, I think this is a really good place to stop. So I'm going to stop here, um, and then we'll go, we'll finish. Well, now that we've gone through the entire cycle, knowing what happens during a typical cycle, what we're going to talk about on Wednesday is more about what happens, say, if that egg is fertilized, um, what's occurring, what occurs during pregnancy, and first of all, how fertilization occurs. So um, I'm going to, oh, wow, we lost a few people. Well, I'm glad, so, I'm glad you guys stayed. Um, does anybody have any questions now? Um, I posted on that other slide. Um, if any of you arrived late, this is kind of the plan for the week. So today we started reproductive system. We'll finish it on Wednesday. We'll review for the exam. That study guide is on um, Canvas. Um, I will be posting a practice exam for the lab sometime this week. Um, extra credit is due on 28th, and then next week is our exam. So does anybody have any questions? Everyone's always so quiet. No, I don't have any questions. All right, Joseph, you're, you're always the spokesperson. All right. All right. So if there's no questions. Um, we'll stop right here. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Obviously, I've got this recorded. I'll send you the link. Um, if you have any questions, email me. Um, otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Those of you in my physio class, I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Thank have you. A good day.